Hi, everyone, and happy day before Valentine's Day. We are really happy to have you join us today for our session on mentoring women in STEM. Um, this is a collaboration between University at Buffalo Women in STEM Cooperative and Harvard University Teaching and Learning Lab and the Graduate School of Education. And one of our goals for this series, in addition to sharing out information with you from some of our experts, we really want you to have the opportunity to connect with other people in the field, develop a community of practice, share some of the challenges or successes that you are having with others. And one of the reasons that we chose Shindig is because it really helps you navigate um, some of those conversations. And the way that you can do that, if you see you are all floating down on the bottom of the screen, and the idea is that that replicates how it might be at a cocktail party or even a conference where you are just wandering around and you might come up to somebody and have a conversation. So we really encourage you to just reach out and click on somebody else's picture, introduce yourself, um, share a little bit about you know where you're from and what some of the challenges are that you're having. And as a reminder, for those of you that have not used Shindig before, when you are floating around on the bottom of the screen, nobody else can hear you talk unless you click on the other person's picture. And once you click on them and are attached, you can have a, a conversation. The other way to talk to other people in a back channel format is to click on the message sign on the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll see that the first icon that you see are some heads with a number that tells you how many people are logged on. The next one is a little message box. If you click on there, you can either send a message to everybody or you can send an individual message to just one person that you want to talk to. The next icon you see is a little question mark. We encourage you to ask questions of our guests. While they have uh, some information prepared to share, we would really love for this to be an interactive um, discussion. And there are two ways that you can interact. One is if you click on the question mark and you type in your question. And once that's typed in, your question will be uh, posted on the screen so that everybody can see it. And then our guest will re uh, reply. The other way is if you click on the raise your hand. And by clicking on the raise your hand, you actually get to come right up on stage where I am and have a conversation with one of our experts. So please take advantage of this opportunity to have a conversation and ask your questions and dig a little deeper into some of the things that you've been wondering about related to mentoring women in STEM. Uh, so we do have um, people from 140 different institutions registered for this session, and those people come from all over the globe and from K through 12, a range of universities, as well as the private sector. So there's a really great group of people to interact with and develop your, uh, your community of practice with. And before we move on, I would like to give a quick overview of uh, who our guests will be in the order that they are that they will be joining us. Our first guest is Florence Hus Hudson, who is an inspirational leader and C level executive in technology, business, research, and academia, and she will be our first guest. Followed by Brian Dewsbury, PhD, who is a Gardner Institute Fellow and an assistant professor of biology at the University of Rhode Island. He is the principal investigator for the science ed education and research program. Then next up will be Lisa Utzinger Shen, who is a doctoral candidate in higher education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And Letitia Thomas, director of STEM diversity programs, will wrap things up. So each of our speakers will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. But like I said, um, please take the opportunity to either pose a question or come up on stage and talk with them. And then when each of our speakers are done uh, sharing individually, we will bring them all up on stage as a panel. And that will be another opportunity for you to ask questions, as well as to have them uh, have a conversation amongst themselves. So with that, I would like to invite Florence Hudson up on stage, who will be our first speaker. Hi, Florence. Yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. 
Thank you so much for having me. And hi, everybody. Welcome. So I have a couple of charts. I don't know if someone's going to be projecting them or not. I think you were saying. Tara should, Tara should bring those up. Okay. That sounds good. So um, I'm going to be taught while we, while we do that. I'll be, uh, my name is Florence Hudson. And I'm currently um, founder and CEO of my own little firm called FD Hint, which stands for Florence D. Hudson International, but it's kind of, you know, incognito if you don't know me, it's FD Hint. And I do strategic consulting, like hints on advanced technology and diversity and inclusion um, in academia, industry, and around the planet. So it's really a lot of fun. So I'm a mechanical and aerospace engineer. And as I say, um, lady rocket scientist is a very small club. It can kind of fit like in a taxi, like in most places, unless you're in an aerospace uh, firm. So um, I have found that mentoring has been very valuable for me my entire life. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, longitudinal mentoring. The idea being that people don't usually expect this, and um, I think mentors can be afraid of it. Um, but the idea is that sometimes you can click with somebody and you know the journey they're taking. You get them, they get you, and you say, you know, if you work with me, I'll mentor you for the rest of your life. And I've done that three times so far, uh, beside people I'm related to and my friends. And um, I find it very inspiring for me. It's a two-way street when you mentor. They help me, I help them. And it's really a lot of fun. And so I'm going to talk about how I think that can really help us um, to get women and anybody really into STEM or other fields and to help them on their journey. Because it, it's a long journey if we're lucky, right? And so we really want to have the advice and insight from experts, people who've lived it. They're, they're experts, <laughs> you know, what, whatever their journey was. So I'd like to go to, um, oh, yeah, a little bit about me. I was also very graciously happy that I was a vice president at IBM and a chief technology officer. And I was also a senior vice president and chief innovation officer at Internet2, a little not-for-profit research education consortium. Okay, next chart, please. I only have two charts, so this will be uncumbersome. Um, and so um, what you see here is this is my, my journey. This is my personal journey with a bunch of pictures. And I call this my uh, Florence Gump chart. You know, if any of you saw the movie Forrest Gump, remember how we had pictures with himself and presidents and all these people and people would say, Forrest, where'd you get that? And he was like, I don't know. I just keep running. And so that's kind of what I do. But along my journey, I've been very fortunate um, to have longitudinal mentors. And now I am one. So on the top left um, are my brothers and sister, uh, a little story about me. So my mother actually died the day I was born and my father left. And so my grandmother, who's in the uh, top left middle picture, um, brought me up. So my uncles and my aunt became my brothers and my sister. Complex problem, but that's why I love complexity. My life is complex. So my brother, Frank, the one, the taller one with like the cloud hair, um, he actually used to uh, wake me up early in the morning when I was like two or three years old to watch the Apollo missions take off, the space missions, because nobody else would get up with him when they were at five or six in the morning. So he would, um, he would wake me up and I would have my little Bugs Bunny doll. I loved it. You know, you'd pull the string, you'd say, what's up, doc? And I'd go out there in my little patty pajamas. We'd sit in front of the TV, like in Forrest Gump. And we'd watch these, you know, we'd watch the spacecraft go up. And I used to think, gosh, that's so cool. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and before we uh, move on to our next guest, I want to remind everyone that you can raise your hand or um, post a question if you have any questions. And Florence will be back up at the panel at the end. And I would love for people to share in the chat how they found their mentors. I know um, conferences have been a really great place for me to meet people. But I've also found social media, you know, joining in on conversations on Twitter, following people on LinkedIn. Those are also really great places to find people that have um, interests that are similar. And I think the last thing I would just add that... Um, I've learned is that a mentor can be younger than you. A mentor can be a different gender. A mentor can be an entirely different profession. So, you know, be open, as you know, Florence said, just be open to the possibilities. Um, all right. So thank you, Meg, uh, Florence. And uh, next up will be Brian Dewsbury and Tara, if you could uh, bring him up. Hi, Brian. How are you today?
Hi, Brian. How are you today? Oh, hi, Brian. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Thank it, you. Took a, it, it took a while. I was giving you a salute sign. And I was getting no response. I was feeling very disappointed. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks so much for joining us today. Right, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. I, I gave a very brief uh, introduction at the start of the episode. I'm not sure if you want to give just a little bit more context about your back. You know, Tell us a little bit more about your role and the research that you're currently doing. Yeah, happy to. Um, so my name is Brian Dewsbury. I am at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I am a research professor, um, and I my lab focus on the social context of learning. And I actually really like the, the question, Patrice, because you say, "What is your role?" And and mm -hmm. I like I like the use of the word role because what happens a lot with positions like mine is. People have this general sense of your faculty or your research faculty or teaching faculty or both, and that implies very specific things. And you know, when I began this position, I was very clear to the, to, to myself that how I want the, the the products of this position defined is to tie back to mentoring, to tie back to social justice, and that might mean we have to do things that are a little bit outside the bounds or outside what people usually associate with faculty life. Um, so my role is really to better understand how social environments and social contexts impact the learning process, both for teachers and for students, and to really think about how our new understandings of those things can help inform curriculum design, um, administrative structures, or just any part of the education ecosystem. Um, so. I, I guess officially my field is it's is called STEM education research. And I stumble a little bit because I, as you could probably tell, I tend to have issues with titles. <laughs> uh, but but it, there is value of people who are trained in basic sciences, you know, thinking about education research um, uh, from a basic lens. And uh, because I am, I my, my home is in the Department of Biology, when we research education questions, they have clear relevance and clear avenues to be implemented in a, in a science classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've seen from my angle is some really, honestly, exciting changes. All right, so technology is way different to what it was when I was a college student, which, despite of what you might see on your screen, was not that long ago. <laughs> um, and a lot of the things that we only professors could do or instructors could do in terms of teaching a classroom can now be migrated online at a pretty high quality. I mean, let's just think of the medium we are using right now, right? right? Uh, and just think of what this could mean in terms of if you were teaching a class. I don't wanna advertise for Shindig, but, but for real, it, it actually makes my point for me. So what that does is, and it really shouldn't have taken technology to, for us to ask this question, but what that does is, it really forces us to ask ourselves, why are we asking students to physically show up in a classroom? And, and I really want you, as, we, as you walk away from this webinar in an hour, I really want you to think about that. Because if the answer is to deliver this body of knowledge, that might be something that could be replaced. And, and I think what the, what the glass half full way of thinking about technology is that it has, it has resurfaced the importance of building relationships, building community, building trust as an integral, if not the most integral part of the education process. Um, and that's where this whole um, uh, job of mine, I think, connects to mentoring as, as, a, as a part of it. Um, it's, it's, it's about relationships and it's about the quality of those relationships and the, the knowledge that, that goes into making those relationships authentic. Um, so as part of my job, uh, we, you know, we're a research lab, so we, we, we write papers, we, we answer interesting questions. Um, I also really, really enjoy teaching, so I do teach four classes a year. But I also have done a lot of faculty development over the last three years or so, and that, that has been a really um, enjoyable process 
it is good to travel and see how different universities function and how they think about questions around teaching, questions around inclusion, questions around mentoring. Um, and, and I would say for the most part, people people want to do the right thing. You know, I, I don't I don't meet faculty who who are trying to weed out hundreds of kids. You know, I, I meet people who are really trying to figure out how to make this this thing work. Mm -hmm. And as it pertains to mentoring, I just want to make this point. And um, you know, quite honestly, I really want to leave most of this time for the audience because I think that's where the most benefit lies. But I really want to make this one point. When we discuss mentoring, a lot of times when when faculty bring this up, there is this underlying assumption that we're talking about how do you get a student to go towards this particular career or be inspired to become a professor or a doctor or whatever it is. And I think we need to take a broader view of what mentoring is, right? Because when you're, when you're talking about mentoring, there is an underlying assumption that the individual has a clear understanding of what a future version of themselves could look like and thus can easily identify the individual or individuals who can mentor them in that direction. Mentoring could just be, I need an example of somebody who knows how to balance family life with work. <laughs> mentoring yeah. could be, I need somebody to, who, who can teach me how to find my voice so I can go and ask for help when I need it. Mentoring could be somebody who has the two minutes to ask me if I'm hungry. Okay, so so it, it, we need to sort of get a bit away. We need to get away a bit from this sense that mentoring are these one-on-one, -on -one, twenty-minute, go into detail conversations that happen once a week, every two weeks. You know, I, I, I when I talk to faculty, my words really are invest in every moment. One of the privileges I've had is when I meet students sometimes, you know, who've taken my class and, you know, graduated or were still in school or whatever. And sometimes they will say, you know, when you said that thing in class about whatever it was, it really made me think differently about, um, about my career or what I liked. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> I say a lot of things, but it yeah. doesn't matter. They remember, right? And that was a mentoring moment. So that means to me, the lesson in that is, Whenever you are engaging in an interaction with a student, regardless of their identity or background, that is an opportunity to mentor and should be treated as such. So whether it's a hallway conversation or a, a, a 50 minute classroom or one on one or office hours, they are looking to you for an example of how to think and how to make a, a sense of meaning of that emerging adulthood process. So mm -hmm. I will leave you with that. Um, Unless Patricia have any follow-up questions for me. Uh, well, we'd love to hear from the audience. I know there was a lot of uh, rich points that you brought up that um, I would, I'd love to talk more about. And I really like the comment about mentoring not having to be, um, like you don't already have to know where you want to go and a mentor shouldn't necessarily um, be that person that only directs you somewhere. And it reminded me, I've been reading the Michelle Obama book, Becoming. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. At the beginning of the book, she says that um, the question we always ask kids when they're young is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And mm -hmm. that sounds so finalistic and mm -hmm. it goes against the whole lifelong learning process. Um, right, right. And I well, know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Let me just interrupt you real quick, just because I want to make a point I was talking about this just yesterday. Not only is it, 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 it gives you know, grow up gives sort of an end point to what you want to be. But it also makes it seem as though if you don't know, there's some, you didn't, you know, you didn't do the right thing if you don't know what you want to be, right? And yeah. we kind of carry this attitude into college, right? How we treat undecideds, <laughs> right? If you don't know your major, if you don't know your career choice, then you're not doing college right. Um, right. I think there's some wrong messages that are being sent. Uh, and it starts with that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's really, uh, really right. Are there, from that standpoint, I know you mentioned um, having faculty think about like, you know, every time they have an interaction with a student, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to mentor. Can you mm -hmm. share a little bit um, about any types of faculty development or uh, ideas or suggestions if, you know, some of the people in our audience wanted to start to have these conversations with faculty at their institutions? Um, well, you're, you're asking uh, two slightly separate things. Uh, I'll address the first one 
in a second. The second thing about you know people having faculty with uh, having conversations with their faculty, it, it's a little bit in the train the trainer realm because mm -hmm. to have the conversation, I think you you really want to have a bit of a base of what that conversation should look like and how people might react to it. Um, you know, at the, at, the, at the base of of this idea of mentoring in every moment is really a, a changed paradigm of what it means to teach. For, for so long, especially in STEM, we have been brought up in a culture of teaching as the delivery of content. We are the experts in this very reductionist world and our goal is to, to impart the technicalities of this uh, on, onto you know, empty vessels. But when you move away from that, as the K-12 world has done so long ago, because we always late to the party, um, to, to te not teaching subjects, but teaching students, right? Now you have to think of teaching in terms of building relationships. Mm -hmm. So in terms of faculty development, before we start to talk about any kind of strategies or tips and tricks to do in the classroom or what happens on Monday morning, I talk to faculty about getting to know yourself. What about your, what are your implicit biases? What do you know about your own growing up? What, what advantages did you have or disadvantages that you had that informed your journey to this point and how does that impact your decision, or not decision in some cases, to, to be a professor of this craft? And how does it inform why you wake up to do this every day? Okay, so we have that conversation. Then secondly, what do you know about the students in front of you? Like anything, where do they come from? <laughs> are they low income, high income, middle income? Um, why are they in your class? What is the mission of your school and how does the mission of your school tie to the students who are in front of you? What are assumptions are the students making in your class and assumptions that you are making? So really, it's only, for me, it's only when you understand those things and you build a relationship around that knowledge, can you then begin to talk about building classroom climate and building trust, right? right. Uh, as, as, as Florence said, um, you know, she kind of used, or maybe it was you actually, who, who used the idea of a cocktail party. No, we have no alcohol. For those who listen, right. um, but but I actually use that example as well in the sense that the authentic relationships in your life are built on knowledge. They're built on trust, right? They're built on the fact that you you share authentic information and 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 you get to a point where you're vulnerable enough to share certain things about yourself. And it is within that space, right, that 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 you exchange knowledge and exchange different things. I'm not saying that your students have to be your best friends, but I'm saying that. If you're going to build a trusting community, there are certain prerequisites to that, right? A knowledge of self and knowledge of student is that. So, you know, it's 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 a deep process. It's a long-term process. Um, and I tell I tell faculty that you really have to be willing to commit to it. But mm -hmm. I, I don't talk about any kind of specific strategies until we really address that piece. Do you, I know um, as somebody who works in faculty development, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it can be difficult, you know, especially at a research one university, faculty have a lot of different time commitments and things that they're balancing. Mm -hmm. And as much as they care so deeply about students, sometimes it's hard to find the time to do all of these things. Do you, do you find it difficult to um, help faculty find the time, you know, to really be intentional about this? Oh, it's extremely difficult, and um, and and this is where I think we need, and by we I mean faculty developers need to be very careful about how we have these conversations. Let me let me put it this way: Th there's a bit of a pendulum swing that has happened, I would say, over the last two decades in terms of STEM pedagogy, right? 10, 15 years ago, it was all the students' fault. They never, they didn't come prepared. They 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 weren't interested. They weren't engaged. All right, so it was a good thing if we failed 25, 30% of them, right? Then yeah. as the active learning movement grew, it became the faculty fault. They, they're stubborn, they, they, they don't wanna change, they inert, you know, pick your nasty adjective, put it there, right? But I, I take the position that when a faculty member wakes up in the morning, they don't say to themselves, how can I fail as many students as I can? I, I don't really, I'm naive enough to believe that that's not really what they want, right? And on the same token, I don't believe a student wakes up in the morning and pays X thousands of dollars of tuition and says, what is the quickest way to an F in this course? 
Mm -hmm. So so if you're with me on that assumption, now we have to start asking different questions. You have to start asking questions of the system, not of people. You have to start asking questions, what is it about this system that doesn't allow the stakeholders to be empowered enough to make the kinds of decisions that leads to collective success? Mm -hmm. So as much as I do focus on inclusion and inclusive environments about students, part of my message when I travel, Patrice, is there needs to be an inclusive environment around faculty as well. You can't teach a four four load with no summer support and no time for professional development and then be told you need to transform your class by next semester, right? You have no time for intervention and anything like that. So, so this moves from really a discussion about deficits in any particular individual and a system that doesn't encourage inclusion to happen. And that's why I think when we started out five years ago, yes, you know, we, we did the whole regression model on looking for the big thing that will cure all of STEM. But now a lot of our work, just back to your first question about my role, is really looking at how research and implementation happens. And in implementation, you have to start asking questions about uh, systems of institutions of higher education and, and the parts of it that doesn't allow for inclusion to happen. You know, there's more to that, but I'll stop because I know we, we do have all day. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love uh, the, the comment about looking at the whole system. I think frequently we don't do that and we forget mm -hmm. what a complex system a university is and the importance of looking at what's going mm -hmm. on inside and outside the classroom. Uh, you're right, right for, for both students and faculty. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Um, thank you. Just to remind everyone, um, you know, everybody will be up at the end for a panel and Q&A. And now we have uh, Lisa Shen joining us. Hi, Lisa, how are you? Patrice? Hi. Yep, now I can hear you. <laughs> um, I just said good afternoon like 15 times. Um, good afternoon. Oh. Thank you, Patrice, for inviting me to present um, my dissertation research. And um, I'm going to apologize to everyone on Shindig that my presentation is a little bit more of a formal research presentation than the previous two presenters. Um, so hopefully it will be, um, it won't be as engaging as Florence and Brian, but um, Hopefully it will be interesting. Um, so I will I will just talk through some of my slides. I'm I'm presenting a small piece of my dissertation research, which um, is focused on um, doctoral students' career decision making at an elite research institution, and um, sort of tailored this presentation around mentoring women in STEM to um, to address the topic at hand. So um, let's start with the first slide, please. So this is not news to anyone here, but the, the problem that I'm, I'm interested in with my research that I hope to address in, um, in this discussion is that obviously there are more women entering um, higher education than ever before at the bachelor's and master's degree levels, and also at the doctoral level. So more women are getting STEM PhDs um, today, but the numbers are not commensurate with the women who are becoming faculty. So as an example, 50% of women um, in the biological sciences are, 50% um, of the PhDs are going to women in the biological sciences, but only 33% of newly hired tenure and tenure track positions are going to women. Um, for between 4% and 15% of STEM full professorships are held by women at the top 50 American universities and nine to 16% of tenure and tenure track positions in math intensive fields, essentially STEM fields, at the top 100 American universities go to women. So there's a real drop off between the women who are getting STEM PhDs and the women who are continuing on into the faculty ranks. Next slide, please. So today's presentation, I will talk um, briefly about advising and mentoring um, sort of gender differences in the literature. I'll present the research questions from my study and um, sort of touch on the research design. I won't go into depth on it. Um, 
I'll try to spend most of the time on sort of the key findings of this research and then discuss discuss the practical implications that um, that come out of it. Next slide. So in the sciences, doctoral advising is considered sort of the heart of scientific training and that relies on the apprenticeship model. So unlike um, sort of more of the informal advising that the previous two presenters discussed, doctoral advising um, in the sciences tends to be extremely formal, one-on-one, -on -one, apprenticeship-based with, with a master, um, master scientist teaching an apprentice with the idea that the apprentice will become the master in time and, and continue on that legacy of training. Um, we know that improved advising increases timely graduation rates and reduces attrition rates, but in general, women are reporting sort of less satisfaction with their advising experiences in um, STEM PhD programs. So women are receiving less faculty guidance in designing research, writing grant proposals, and co-writing publications. And for those who work in faculty um, positions know that these are sort of the critical training that you need to get in graduate school to A, be successful on the academic job market, and B, to go through promotion and receive tenure. You need these. So if women are sort of saying they're less satisfied with that, that's, that's a big problem, and that is contributing to the gap between women and men in academic positions. Next slide, please. Um, so when we look at men and women in advising, men are in STEM specifically reporting more positive experiences with their dissertation advisors. Women are more likely to switch their dissertation advisors. They're more likely to say that in hindsight, they would have used different criteria in selecting dissertation advisors. And men are more likely than women to seek advice for choosing a postdoc from their advisor. Next slide. Specific to mentoring, um, we know from the research that mentoring is more effective for women than for men. It improves um, female graduation rates in PhD programs and improves successful employment rates. And the three primary benefits of mentoring for women in STEM PhDs are one, exposure to new models for careers. So whether it's um, opening women's eyes to faculty careers or non-academic careers, two, feelings of acceptance and empowerment. And my research in particular speaks to um, not necessarily the study, but in general, my research speaks to this being really critical that women are entering PhD programs in STEM with less self-confidence than men. And so having a mentor who can show them that they are capable of mastery, that they are accepted into the field as a legitimate researcher and scientist um, is, really, is really empowering and critical for women to make the next step into following an academic career. Um, and third, sponsorship by a mentor is also, you know, can make or break a career, whether that's, um, you know, financial sponsorship, getting money to go to conferences to present their research or funding for specific um, equipment to do to conduct research or access to, to large scale data sets or sponsorship in the sense of having um, a strong letter from a from an academic advisor, faculty advisor to go out on the job market with. Next slide. So my research questions um, for this study had to do with one, how do advisors impact the career aspirations of doctoral students in the life and physical sciences at Calder University? Calder is a pseudonym um, to protect the participants in the study. I'm using a pseudonym. And two, what are the processes and mechanisms that enhance or limit these doctoral students' career aspirations? Next slide. Just a quick overview, I did 40 semi-structured interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with participants. The um, participants were mostly white, 57% white, 19% Asian, 65% um, of them were women, so not surprising that more women than men would participate in an interview-based study. 79% um, of the students overall had male advisors and 21% had female advisors. The average range age was 28. Um, they're mostly single, never married, and um, as using parent education as a proxy for socioeconomic status, they were mostly middle and upper middle class with 96% having one or both parents with a bachelor's degree and one in four students having one or both parents with a PhD. The students came from the life sciences and physical sciences, although I sort of refer to them as STEM, they're specific to life and physical sciences. Um, and um, 50 50 rough split between life and physical sciences, although more women were in the life sciences than the physical sciences. Um, 
most of the interviews were in person and I did do um, 20% over Skype due to geographic constraints. Um, and then each participant received a $25 Amazon gift card. Um, next slide, please. So turning um, to the key findings, overall, I found that there were disparate satisfaction um, rates by gender in terms of their advising, which sort of corresponds with the previous literature. Within my sample, 67% of the men and 58% of the women indicated overall satisfaction with their advisor. So more men than women were overall satisfied with their advisor. And overall, more women than men reported being dissatisfied with their advising experience. 35% versus 25% of um, women and men were dissatisfied. More men than women, however, switched advisors. So 25% of the men and 15% of the women switched advisors, which is um, sort of refutes the the literature that states that more women than men are switching advisors. But I thought that was interesting. Next slide. Um, one of the one of the key findings I, I found really interesting was sort of same sex advising and um, overall because of the university and because of the sciences most of the students had seventy five percent of students were advised by at least one male faculty member so um, I say by a, by at least because some students switched advisors and some students were co advised but the majority you know three out of four students had had at least a, ma a male advising them. Um, in terms of same-sex advising, women, 35% of women worked with uh, at least one female advisor and 71% of men worked with at least one male advisor. The women with female advisors, however, were more likely to report negative experiences. So even though there were fewer women working with same-sex advisors, those women, 67%, were more likely than men with male advisors, 30%, to report negative experiences. Um, but both women and men reported positive experiences with male advisors. So 67% of the students overall had a positive experience with a male advisor compared with 33% of the students overall who had a positive experience with a female advisor. Next slide. So why is that? Why do you see these, these differences? I think one thing you can look at is that tenure matters. So where you are in the tenure track, 64% of the male advisors and 33% of the female advisors were tenured. Um, so the participants who are working with advisors um, mostly had, if they were working with a male advisor, it was more likely or not, than not that he would be tenured versus a female advisor who was less likely to be tenured. And for students, several students observed their advisors go through the tenure process, and it was a real turnoff for them in terms of in, being interested in working in academia. Next slide. So for example, Stephanie was a life sciences doctoral student and she had a female advisor who was going up for tenure soon. So Stephanie told me during my fourth year was when things in the lab started to change a little bit because my advisor sort of felt tenure coming closer and closer. And I think if there's something that determines how much you wanna go into academia, it's watching someone else go through the tenure process. That's when I started really questioning whether I wanted to stay in academia, just seeing all the crap she puts up with and how much she has to sacrifice in other parts of her life. Next slide. So this is in contrast with Stephanie's experience. Lauren is a physical sciences student. And also these the students that I'm um, discussing all had female advisors, by the way. So Lauren had a, a tenured female advisor, and she, um, she had a really good experience. And I would say Lauren's example and other students' examples in the study show that students, um, which is sort of counterintuitive, but students who had more formal professional advising relationships, so less... Um, less maybe less warm or less personal, ultimately reported more positive experiences and were more likely to stay on in academia post-graduation. So Lauren told me, I really like my advisor overall. I really have a lot of respect for her and our relationship has always been primarily professional. We haven't really talked a lot about personal lives. It's tough to have conversations with her. So it's always been very professional, but supportive. And she's great to write papers with. She always responds to email within hours and she meets with us once a week. So Lauren, um, sort of lamented to me that she didn't, she liked her advisor a lot, but she didn't, um, she was disappointed that she didn't have a personal relationship with her advisor. And she wished in hindsight, she wished that they had, um, her advisor had been more um, open with her about her life. And she said, you know, we have a lot in common and, um, you know, there are a lot of things we could have bonded over, but for whatever reason, my advisor kind of kept me at arm's length. Um, and so I, I will come back to this, but I think overall, 
even though it's counterintuitive that the students who were kept more at arm's length ended up being more likely to stay on in academia than the students who were given sort of insider um, access to their, their advisors' personal lives. Um, next slide, please. So um, Divya was a, a student, a doctoral student who had a female advisor who um, really exposed her personal life to her. So Divya um, said, if your job has to be so all encompassing like this, where she's not seeing her children because she's crying to me that she doesn't say goodnight to them in person because she's too busy at work and stuff, that wasn't something that was highly desirable. If this is what it takes to succeed in academia, then I don't think I'll be successful. And so I heard that refrain over and over and over again from female doctoral students. You know, if this is what it takes to succeed in science, if this is what it takes to succeed in academia, count me out. Um, and it was students like Divya and students like um, Stephanie who had sort of, you know, front row seats to how hard it was for women in academia, had seen their advisors struggle with balancing um, children and having sort of no work-life balance that led them to really pull away from academic careers. Um, so, and these were often were, um, in Divya's case, advisors who crossed personal boundaries. So um, Divya's advisor, you know, cried in front of her and showed her, showed her like intimately how difficult it was for her. Um, and Divya's advisor and um, Stephanie's advisor were both pre-tenure compared to Lauren's advisor who had tenure and also didn't let Lauren in on um, some of the internal struggles she may have faced as a woman in academia. Next slide, please. Um, Jane is another uh, life science doctoral student who had a female advisor. She said, the choices that I see her having made to be a PI are not necessarily choices I would make. She's in lab a lot. She's working all the time. She's super stressed. And lately she's been saying, oh, I don't sleep well. I wake up screaming at night, which is just like, oh my God, what are you doing? Just take a break, relax. But she never takes a break. If that's what it takes to succeed in science, I do not love science anywhere near enough to do that. So again, just a, a lot of women um, who you know are considering academic careers and then seeing their 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 primary mentor um, living a lifestyle that is not something that so seems appealing to them. Next slide. So all these sort of um, issues, not all of them, but the three of the women who were really struggling with their female advisors they're gleaning sort of work-life balance choices and struggles. So students, um, and this goes to both women and men with, with male and female advisors, but um, especially the women advisors, students observed poor work-life balance that manifested in late night and weekend emails, emailing while their advisors were on vacation. Um, one, one student talked about having an advisor who slept in the office. Um, one student had an advisor who, you know, a snowstorm was coming and, was didn't want to miss work the next day so like took a sleeping bag and slept in the office several students talked about advisors who returned to work immediately after childbirth so um you know stu students who had said she had a c-section and was back in work you know the next week um and then several students men and women talked about having advisors who would tell them to get a house spouse or a stay-at-home spouse who would be able to manage the domestic duties so that they could work on their um their professional careers. Next slide. So what does this mean um, for, for science, for academia? Um, you know, I think my overarching thesis really has to do with the PhD advisor in STEM and being sort of one of the most, if not the most driving factors affecting career outcomes. So whether a student decides to go into academia or not, a lot of it has to do with the, the the PI, the advisor, and the mentor. Um, certainly there are students who go into STEM PhD programs with no intention of becoming academics and that um, what, regardless of who their mentor is, that, that won't change their trajectory that much. I mean, it can, there, there are instances of that happening, but um, for the most part, if a student is going to stay on in academia, the, the mentoring has to be um, strong and the, um, the student has to feel like they're, they're gaining the training and the confidence they need to succeed on on, in a really difficult job market. Um, I think given what we know about how um, how women are sort of internalizing the modeling from their mentors of how a science academic career, what it can look like, how it impacts their personal lives, um, I think that women advisors and male advisors need to be more mindful of how we mentor women and that men and women 
um, are internalizing these messages differently, that the men may see um, a, a woman PI struggle with, with work-life balance and think, oh, well, that's not me and I'm not a woman, so I won't deal with that. They're less likely to see a male PI struggle with it. Um, but women are, are really internalizing these messages. And so not to say that we should um, hide them from women, but just to put it into context and that this could be specific to Calder University or it could be specific to a, a, a specific department or a specific time and place and that there are many, many jobs. Most of the students in my um, my study don't you know, work at Calder University either immediately or ever. And so um, having one, one example from one institution isn't necessarily representative of what they would experience as a faculty member at another R1 university. Um, tenure matters. Obviously, pre-tenure faculty stress trickles down to advisees, and we need to think about both from an institutional level, how can we support um, faculty as they go through tenure, and, and I don't know if there's a way to make it less stressful, and also how can we support students who have faculty who are going through tenure or just coaching students around when you choose a faculty member as your advisor who's pre-tenure versus post-tenure and what that can mean for um, the messages you're getting, the type of advising you're getting, the the role modeling you're getting, and, and putting that into context. Um, interestingly, one of the other things to come out of the study is that both women and men are interested in work-life balance, and the literature on work-life balance in STEM academic careers really points to women wanting to have um, balance to raise children, but my research kind of um, refutes that a little bit because the students in my study, almost all of them were did not have children. So there were a couple that did, but they weren't necessarily making choices. Some of them were, but most of them were by and large not making choices based on their future children. They were more um, interested in mental health and having um, having a career that would would be you know personally fulfilling and less about sort of um, the prestige or the the um, you know, killing themselves to, to, to get to a certain level if it wasn't personally um, going to bring happiness to their lives. So there was, uh, I think, a little bit of a different, a cultural shift in how millennials are thinking about their careers in, in regards to um, work-life balance and not just being driven by family needs. Next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, this is like a big ask, but I think universities should promote healthier work-life balance for faculty and try to reduce stress loads and stress levels and, and be mindful of how um, doctoral students who are going to populate the, um, the, prof the professor are, are internalizing these messages. Um, faculty should be more thoughtful about how their stress and lifestyles impact their doctoral students. It, it's not clear to me whether faculty are aware that this is coming, going, like the sort of the role modeling is impacting them or whether they're thinking, okay, this is really hard and my students, my female students need to know how hard it is and have access to this knowledge. Um, but it did seem overall that students whose, whose advisors were um, a little bit more professional and less personal in their relationships had advisors who, advisees who fared better and were more likely to stay on in academia. Um, I think we talked about this in the previous two presentations, but women, um, you know, should have more than one mentor. So you don't need to, you know, in, in the academic world and doctoral education, you have your primary mentor and that's sort of the, the way that we are trained, but there needs to be more at the institutional level, more support for um, students seeking out other mentorship um, formally, I think is probably the best way is having, having students, um, you know, have their, their PI as their primary mentor and then having another, um, another mentor within the, the department, ideally, or within the field who can also just be a sounding board. And um, I know it's politically challenging if you're having problems with your PI to have another mentor who's their colleague and you're um, potentially complaining to them and that can be hard. But from, from the research I've done, I think people really benefit when they have multiple mentors or, you know, having a professional mentor versus uh, an academic mentor. Um, and then I also would encourage women to have mentors across institutions. So having Calder University, you have a mentor, set of mentors, but then maybe your mentor from undergrad, you can maintain that longitudinal relationship that Florence discussed, or having a mentor from someone you met at a conference, um, 
who, who maybe doesn't work at an R1 institution or maybe works at a different type of institution to, to support you and give you feedback, I think is critical. So I, with that, I will turn um, the, the stage back to Patrice and um, open myself up to any questions that Patrice has and look forward to the Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was really interesting. And I know we hear a lot about women not per persisting through PhD programs in the um, in STEM, and I had never thought about it from that perspective that it could be what uh, what advisors were sharing. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about, I know a faculty member that I spoke with one time had said, you know, I spent all these years getting my PhD to go into a profession I'm not trained for. Nobody taught me how to teach. Nobody taught me how to manage a budget. You know, nobody taught me how to manage people. And so do you, did you see any, and that might, this might not have been part of your research, but ways that um, almost like ad mentoring for advisors, is that like a gap that we have? I think so. I um, so that definitely was addressed in other other parts of my dissertation and other chapters. That um, I talk a lot about advisors' management style, and one of the the constant refrains that students would discuss um, had to do with the sort of hands on, hands off men, um, management style. And students who thought they were hands on and then had a hands on advisor and really disliked that, or vice versa. Um, yeah. And so I think. Yes, I, ideally there would there's like a gap where um, you know Brian talked about how there's no there's no time for revising your curricula there's no time for um, you know faculty to get training to be good management man, managers right so um, in an ideal world I think we do need better better training for faculty to to be good mentors and and um, to train doctoral students in in ways that are sort of Re reflect our, our current understanding in the learning and teaching sphere that um, there is research on this. So one of the things that I talk about in my dissertation is I think, you know, while it'd be great to train all these faculty members, re in reality, at a place like um, an R1 university, there's less incentive to get trained because you're not rewarded with tenure based on your, your teaching, your mentoring and teaching. So, um, you know, while, while I think people like me and others can ask for improved um, management training for faculty. I argue in my dissertation that we need to train students to be, um, I guess, better mentees and also to be better at identifying whether they need hands-on or hands-off mentoring or what that looks like for them and to be better communicators with their advisors upfront about what, what it is they're looking for and to see if before they make the match, if it is gonna work for them. And students talk about, you know, they. They research it through by talking to other doctoral students or postdocs in the lab and try to find, before they select a lab during their rotations, they try to find out as much as they can. Um, mm -hmm. But the more they can do that, the better. And then the more, at the end of the day, the more that they they know themselves, know what they need at, as a learner and how that's going to, you know, and that obviously changes throughout the doctoral program. But um, at the beginning, the crucial, you know, first couple years, knowing, knowing themselves really well helps a lot. And then also, um, sort of, you know, managing up and knowing how to how to make the most of your advisor's strengths, and then for any weaknesses that your advisor may have in mentoring or teaching and training, finding other ways to meet those um, on your own is what I've seen work really well. It seems like you, Brian, and Florence will have to get together and develop some new uh, for, uh, program. <laughs> um, there was there was a question in the um, the message about literature and i'm wondering um if, if you know if people want additional information on literature can they um email you to get yeah, absolutely. yeah absolutely and i really i sort of um glossed over the literature really quickly in the interest of time but yeah i do have um bibliographies i can share okay great thank you so next what we'll do is um bring leticia and the other panelists up on the stage for a panelist q a um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put them in the, um, the question box and we will bring them up. So um, we will have Leticia, Brian, Lisa, and Florence will have the opportunity to talk with one another and uh, Leticia will start it off. So thank you.
Sure, thanks. I put together a few slides on some mentoring activities that we have here uh, at the University of Buffalo. And it's interesting, um, uh, when I was talking about mentoring uh, PhD students, I, uh, I have actually in my presentation, faculty advisors are the most influential and traditional mentoring relationship for graduate students. So it was interesting um, looking at the research um, that was just presented about how, you know, that is absolutely true, but that can be fraught with a lot of uh, problems and, and issues. Um, but that's still, you know, the best relationship that we have. And um, hopefully, you um, you know, we can come together uh, to work on some of that. So I just had a few slides with uh, some of the um, mentoring information that we have here at UB. So we have mentoring for undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty and staff on campus. And when I started uh, researching this, uh, my colleague Becky Burke um, did a, an inventory and, and uh, helped me out and, and got me jump started on this. But then as I started to delve deeper, I thought, wow, we have a lot of mentoring on campus. And, you know, like a lot of our one um, institutions, I think the, the devil is in trying to connect students, faculty, staff with all of the wealth of resources that we have on campus. Um, so we have uh, mentoring opportunities for undergraduate students. One of the biggest ones on campus is called Realm. And that stands for Real Experience and Leadership Mentoring Program. And this is a one-day uh, mentorship program where students can actually shadow um, a UB alum and uh, go to their uh, place of employment. Of course, it, it would have to be a local alum. Um, and there is one for New York City as well. There's a Realm New York. So for those students who may be on a, a spring break or on an extended winter break, if they live in the New York City metro area, they can all they can also shadow a UB alum in New York. Um, but this, you know, mentorship program um, is <clears throat> a shadowing experience for undergrads, and um, most of the undergrads I know who have participated really do enjoy that a lot. Um, they get to sort of um, see a typical day um, for uh, an alum in their. Um, uh, area of career interest, and it's extremely valuable. Um, we also have something that I didn't even know we had called our UB LinkedIn Mentor Program. So we can link students with others. Um, we can link students with other people, um, with alums in their area of interest through LinkedIn. And so that doesn't have to be local or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that can be very broad. There's um, about 1,200 uh, UB alumni on LinkedIn currently that we can link with um, students that we have here at UB. Uh, we also have our experiential learning network, um, and that is for extra or co-curricular experiences. They have a mentorship program um, where they have faculty come in and volunteer to mentor students on kind of a walk-in basis. So the faculty will come uh, to the Experiential Learning Network offices um, and they'll have what they call unconventional um, office hours. So students can sort of drop in and ask questions and they can receive mentorship in that way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have um, faculty mentoring programs for underrepresented students. We have three grants on campus that do a really excellent job at that. Um, the LSAM program, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, that happens to be my, my program. Um, and they, um, we facilitate uh, undergraduates uh, having a faculty uh, mentorship uh, through research. We also have uh, our CSTEP program that's funded by New York State. And that's a very similar program um, that encourages 
teaches faculty to mentor undergraduate students. And we also have a program that's funded by NIH called CLIMB, uh, and that's the Collaborative Learning and Integrated Mentoring in the Biosciences. And that's in our medical school, um, and that serves uh, undergraduates and graduate students. And again, that is uh, for um, underrepresented students to try to get those students into the biosciences. Uh, my program is to get students in STEM. Uh, the CSEP program is to get students in STEM and the health-related and licensed professions. So those are three of our big programs on campus that help underrepresented students to really connect with faculty um, via, it starts off via research, but you know, it's also our hope that it also um, helps uh, our students connect to faculty um, to get letters of recommendation, to get career advice, uh, to get advice about courses. Um, so we, it is always our hope that it extends beyond uh, the research. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for PhD students, um, again, our, our faculty uh, advisors are our most um, important uh, source of mentoring, but mo many of the graduate departments also uh, have mentoring programs. One of them is called the UB Network uh, for Enriched Academic Relationships, or UB NEAR, uh, and that's just a network of faculty members, many of them in the arts and humanities, um, that have volunteered to serve as mentors to graduate students, and that was another one that I was and uh, even aware that was on campus. Um but that was something uh, started by the Graduate Student Association, and they found faculty members to volunteer to um, mentor uh, to mentor graduate students specifically. Uh, the School of Management and School of Architecture and Planning have their own mentorship programs, and I have links uh, to those in this presentation. Um, the School of Management program is really a peer-to-peer -peer, um, relationship, so peers can mentor other peers. It can be a a little overwhelming to be a first year MBA student. And uh, so, you know, other uh, students um, kind of reach back and help first year students. Um, and in the School of Architecture, they partner with uh, professional organizations. So the American Planning Association and the American Institute of Architects. And um, using those professional organizations, they have developed a mentoring program that works really well for them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the School of Law has a their mentoring program. They rely um, heavily on alumni, um, so um, the uh, and they really look for attorneys that have been admitted three years or more uh, to the bar to mentor law students. And again, this could be about law school. This could be for career advice, um, and that is. Um, something that uh, is Western New York attorneys uh, who are alums of UB Law School come back and mentor students. Um, and then the School of Social Work um, also links their alumni with current students um, for mentoring relationships there. Uh, next slide, please. The Graduate School of Education um, alumni Association uh, links fellow alumni to provide um, mentoring for not only current students, but also fellow alumni. Uh, so again, um, UB does a really great job of reaching out to its alumni to help um, mentor students, which I think is you know, a, a really great practice uh, to have in addition to the faculty mentorship um, that students might receive. Now, one of the, the few projects that actually looks at female students in particular is uh, the School of Engineering's Navigate project. Um, so that's supported by an NSF grant and it looks to increase the number of STEM graduates who persist in their disciplines. And I know uh, based on the research um, that we had previously, you know, this can be a problem or an issue. So our Dean, uh, Liesl Folks, um, who has been uh, on these um, 
webinars in the past, really, um, this is something that is passionate for her. Um, she attends all of the Navigate sessions. There, uh, we tend to have these one-day Navigate sessions where um, the students go over case studies and they um, have keynote speakers. Um, and we do a lot of this case study work to really look at some of the problems and issues. And then from there, try to come up with solutions to make sure that women persist in STEM fields, uh, particularly engineering. But it's open you know, to any um, student, female student who is interested in STEM. So you know, uh, kudos to us in engineering for really looking at um, female mentorship and female persistence in STEM. Uh, next slide, please. And Leticia, I'm not sure how many more slides you have, but I know- Just this is the last one. <laughs> So um, we also, for faculty and staff, um, our Office of Faculty Affairs has a mentoring program, as does our Professional Staff Senate has a, a mentoring program for uh, staff members. And that's the end of my slides. That's a really um, impressive range of mentoring programs UB has. So kudos to them for a great job mentoring. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, have me come down off of the stage and bring up Brian and Lisa so that the four of you have a chance to ask one another questions. Um, I guess I can I can ask Florence. Um, I'm sort of I'm really intrigued by your um, talk on longitudinal mentoring, and um, I guess you know it, it it sounds like such a good idea and and something that it's it's like um, it's like networking, right? Like everyone says like oh just network, and um, but you know how do, what are sort of the concrete steps that you can take to um, you know, for you, for you, you're identifying people and seeing whether it's a match for you before you're offering this lifelong support. Presumably, you're not just saying it to everyone you meet. Um, but for people who are looking for lifelong mentors, what are things that they can do? Um, and how do they ask, you know, I guess, what, what are ways that they can, does it just happen organically? Or do you actually explicitly say, will you be my lifelong mentor? You know, I, can you talk through that a little bit more? You are muted. Florence. Florence. Uh, Am I unmuted now? Yeah. Right. Okay, great. So that's a very good question. So it, it's kind of like saying, will you marry me though? You know, if, if you ask somebody to be the longitudinal mentor, so it's good to, you know, you have a cup of coffee first, you know, so, you know, I always tell people if you see somebody at a conference or at a presentation and you just listen to them, you go, wow, oh, you know, they're so inspiring or, They've been through stuff I'm going through. I, said, I tell them, just reach out and say, could we chat for half an hour? You know, reach out. Everyone, like not everybody, but a lot of people are on LinkedIn or you can find them on Twitter. And, you know, just send them a private message and say, you know, I saw you present. You were so inspiring or whatever. Um, it was great to meet you at this conference. Could we just chat for 30 minutes? And or I just got something on LinkedIn the other day and someone's like, gosh, I met you like a year ago and I've been so busy. I got my PhD. I'm like, oh, congratulations. And she's like, can we talk? I'm like, sure. Like in March, I'm super busy. She's like, OK, I'll, I'll contact you then. So what I'd say is you, know, you find somebody that um, you, you think could be interesting, you just reach out and ask for one discussion. And it could be that the relationship you know, grows and they say, well, would you like to shadow me or you know, would you like to intern for me? And then it can go from there and they may see something in you and say, you know, you, whoever the, the you is, um, and say, you know, I'd be happy to help you. Uh, just mm -hmm. keep in touch with me or I'll mentor you for the rest of your life, which is kind of poignant, but I'm Italian. I like the drama. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and the love. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say is just get started. I think it would be interesting, you know, Patrice was saying, maybe if we put our heads together, we could do something interesting. You know, maybe we could do something around longitudinal mentoring because no one has said it out loud to me before. And I just kind of thunk it up when I was at Buffalo. <laughs> I think uh, last summer I was presenting at a class and then I, I met with a number of folks while I was there. And then we had this discussion. Maybe we could create a little something. You know, I could start it on it. I could start a blog post or we could do a podcast or something. So if you all are interested in doing that, 
Um, I don't know if I, I think I have all your emails. We could get together and chat about it, but you don't have to. This isn't required. I'm not asking if you, you marry me. You know, it's <laughs> if you want to get, um, if you'd like to be involved and if you have ideas on a good channel or, you know, you'd want to do a webinar on another campus, um, which is another opportunity for anybody listening, really. So if y'all are interested, let me know. Not required. Thank you. So I'm interested, um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, I guess Letitia, you'd be the best one to ask, but Brian and Lisa and Young Open, you guys and ladies are all very experienced. So I'm going to be going up to, uh, and the person might be on the call right now, up to uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'm gonna be meeting with some of the women faculty. And so I was telling them about this webinar and they said, oh, it'd be good to see what are the resources for staff and faculty? You know, like we tend to focus on the students because we want to build the pipeline and we want them to feel loved and, you know, they're just getting started, uh, but people need support. That's why longitudinal mentoring is good. You need support your entire career um, and your entire life. So um, you talked, Letitia, about some interesting things toward the end that you have for the faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that we think of as best practices that, you know, like I could share when I go, you know, meet with these people at RIT as an example? Oh, sure. So our faculty affairs office uh, has a mentoring um, program for faculty. And I believe I'm not uh, extremely familiar with it, but I believe, of course, it would entail um, senior faculty mentoring junior faculty uh, once they come into the institution. And so that is usually um, the way that that mentoring takes place. And I, I suppose I would give them the same um, advice that we give to students is to, you know, have a faculty mentor in your department, but also a faculty mentor outside of your department. Um, departments tend to be very um, different. Um, uh, you know, politics are different, uh, the way they're run, they are run are different. And I think in order for individuals to have um, a greater experience and, and a greater opinion um, of, of how to do things, finding a mentor outside of your discipline might be a great way to do that, as well as certainly having one within your discipline. Um, for staff, our professional staff senate um, has a mentorship program and often, um, and I, I remember taking part in that program uh, when I was um, when I first came to UB many many years ago, and uh, the director of housing happened to be my mentor, and um, and it was funny. He was like, "Well, you know, I signed up for this, and I don't really know if I can help you or not, but you know, I'll do my best." And uh, the fact that he was willing to try uh, at that time uh, was great. And it was just, you know, for someone new on a really large campus, it was just great to have at least kind of one friendly person that you could call. Um, uh, there were times when I didn't know uh, when I needed something and I didn't know uh, who to contact. We have, you know, 5,000 faculty and staff on this campus. So um, our professional staff center uh, was instrumental in putting that together. And we also have here a minority faculty and staff association. We have a LGBT faculty and staff association. So, you know, individuals can seek out those kinds of either interest groups uh, or formalized um, mentorship uh, opportunities uh, in order for them to be able to kind of learn um, the ranks or, or learn the ropes um, of their various departments or um, their areas. Wow, lots so, of data. Let me, let me just jump in. Your, your question was about resources for faculty, correct? Right. right. Um, well, if I may just quickly suggest, um, because uh, I, I did get this question offline as well. Um, there are a surprising amount of faculty and um, who don't understand how the history of social structure, especially in the US, has informed the social context of students in their classroom. Um, there, there's a long reading list we all should be a part of. And I think if anyone's going to be an effective mentor, they need to understand that history. Um, and, and really understand it, not just uh, read it and, and you know, or you read the book, no, reflect on it, have a faculty learning community and discuss it. So, I mean, there's some books I can point to, like um, Stand from the Beginning by Dr. Abraham Kendi, I would strongly suggest. Um, 
uh, a different mirror by Ronald Takaki that, that talks about assimilation and talks about social belonging in different contexts and different communities and how people have navigated that. I would encourage a reading of the history of higher education and how some of the institutions that we work for um, themselves practiced exclusion for a long, long, long time, right? And this idea of facilitative education is a fairly new one for some of us. So, so I think we need to know our history a bit before we are in a mental space to, to actually uh, uh, inspire people to be different. Um, and those are just three examples, but it, there's, believe me, there's a longer list. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Patrice, is it time or should we do one more question? Okay. Yeah. I'm back. It's, such a, it's such a wonderful conversation. I feel like we could talk another couple hours about it. I, I do want to remind people we do have a hashtag helping STEM students thrive. And if you're on our mailing or email list, um, I will gather the people mentioned as well as the slides and put those out with everyone. And with that, I would like to thank our guests for joining us today and thank Shindig for allowing us to use the platform for this event. Uh, and next next month in March, the topic will be the what the, the current state of women in STEM, what the research says, and I will be posting information on date and time and speakers for that on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So look for more information to follow, and thanks again, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You, you too. Bye-bye.